making sense. Having a sound knowledge of pattern matching is perhaps the most helpful concept for a psychotherapist. As you progress in the course, you'll see its direct application to dealing with depression, anxiety, addictions and trauma. This video will supplement your notes. <clears throat> the study of perception is covered in every psychology textbook. At university, as an adult, I loved learning about perception, uh, the mechanics of it, rods and cones and illusions. However, in private practice, I found it of little value, either as an explanation of how we process information or how it could assist in emotionally distressed person. It didn't answer the question I was often asked, <clears throat> Am I looking at this in the wrong way? I would always answer, perhaps a better question would be, is this how it really is, or just the way I think it is? <clears throat> and then follow with a simple explanation of pattern matching, usually with a story. For them to see that patterns set us up to look at things a certain way, and they don't always act in our best interest, was information that really did help them. Simplicity is the key. And while mystique and complexity are part of academic learning, and they make great essay topics, simple explanation raised the prospect of good therapeutic results. We make sense of ourselves and others and our world by matching what we see, hear, feel, taste and smell with what is already on file as a neural element or pattern in our subconscious brain. The continuous stream of information is processed quickly and efficiently. The familiar information has a close match. It's a pattern we understand. And the unfamiliar information takes a little bit longer but with the use of an approximate pattern, we're able to say, hmm, this is like, thus making sense of new information. Finer distinctions come later. Now, in addition to the innate patterns, the ones we're born with, such as the propensity to suck, we're developing new ones all the time. Childhood characterized by those incessant why questions, why this, why that. That's a time when the need to make sense of their world is particularly strong and stimulating experiences during this time sets them up for an ongoing curiosity and a joy of learning that will serve them well all their lives. Pattern matching. We've all seen barcode scanners in supermarkets. Well, pattern matching is similar. Like our sense organ, the scanner doesn't do any processing. It sends it to a data bank where from all the codes on file, it makes a perfect match. A box of cereal for $4.99. This electronic scanning process relies on a perfect match and can only make sense of what is scanned if the exact code has been stored in the data bank. The human brain, however, it's metaphorical in nature and not limited by only being able to make sense of exact matches or what is already on file. It can use approximations to make some sense of totally unfamiliar experiences. Back in the 50s, the British wanted to test some new bombs. And as there's nowhere in the UK where they can test bombs, they come out to our country. They set up in the Western desert regions, but we made them be sure that there were no people there. There were desert Aboriginals who had had no contact with white people. A TV crew making a documentary interviewed Yuwali, who was a teenager at the time, and her expression upon seeing a vehicle approaching was, Look, there's white rocks rolling towards the camp. They've come alive. Now, Yuwali was making sense of new information by matching what she saw, a first-time event, with patterns she already had on file. 
She'd never seen vehicles before, but they were rock-like in shape. Similarly, she'd never seen wheels before, but they were like rolling stones. With more exposure to white people, Yuwali added to her repertoire of patterns, becoming able to make those distinctions between vehicles and rocks. And probably listening to Chuck Berry and Mick Jagger gave her an understanding of rock and roll and rolling stones. Back on track. Pattern matching is an efficient way for the brain to make sense of stimuli based on what it has processed before. It avoids having to deal with a vast array of information as though it's the first time event. Alzheimer's is characterised by poor access to these patterns, therefore responding to each experience as a first-time event. While pattern matching may be an efficient process, it is subject to factors that may increase or decrease its capacity to select appropriate patterns for specific situations. Heightened emotional arousal, for example, it reduces the sophistication in the brain's search for an appropriate pattern or a good match. This is known as black and white thinking. The shades of grey, those insights that give each situation a, a nuance or here and now, are lacking. Where primitive patterns, those lacking nuance, are used over and over again, thinking becomes self-focused narrow and pessimistic instead of expansive, explorative and others focused. This primitive thinking style is usually present when a person is stressed, depressed and other anxiety related conditions. And the recognition that patterns are the filter through which all thoughts are formed and the understanding that emotional arousal, excessive worry, for example, causes a primitive thinking style. And this understanding provides for effective therapeutic approaches. Emotion is in place before thought. So a therapeutic approach that deals with how we are set up to think, not just thinking itself, is likely to be more effective. And it is. Speaking of nuance, let me give you some principles with examples that will help you understand pattern matching in a way that serves you well in your practice. Patterns are essentially subconscious. They're not just memories. I was talking to a person who's a charged sister at Dandenong Hospital, and she told me that every time the medevac helicopter comes in to land, she breaks out in a sweat. She was a triage nurse in Vietnam during the war and the beat of the rotors was enough to trigger in Norma this awareness of I need to rush, I am now in a situation of emergency and extreme concentration about what to do. Now, she's not remembering Vietnam. She hadn't even thought of it. She's doing bookwork in an office. But the stimuli is enough to trigger not a memory, but this pattern associated with being a triage nurse. Another factor is that mem uh, patterns can be triggered by very subtle stimuli, hardly aware of it. My dear old mum, when mum and dad lived with us in the latter stages of their life. Towards evening, as the sun was going down, my mum would walk up from the little unit down where they lived, up into our unit, and as soon as she saw me, she would say, Charlie, are the horses away? Now, I don't have horses, and I'm not Charlie, but the lowering sunlight, darkness coming on, was enough to trigger patterns and she went right back to her teenage years or perhaps childhood when the thing you attended to at about sundown was making sure all your animals were safe. The chooks were put away, the horses were safe, all of those things before night came on. Now, 
that's the pattern triggered by this subtle stimuli. Patterns carry the emotion in which they were formed. Years ago, I was uh, running courses for young people, basically to keep them off the streets. And one of our students, Pete, he got a job on a dairy farm partway through the year, but he still wanted to attend class because we were earning money to pay for a trip, a yacht charter. So I used to pick him up each morning of the class and drive into the other town where the classes were offered. And we come over a hill and here's a big herd of dairy cows. We live in a dairying area, so there's a big herd of cows crossing the road. So, of course, we wait. I'm just waiting. And Pete's sitting next to me. He says, look at that Jersey sulky little bitch. I hate him. And I looked to him. I said, why? Oh, as soon as you put them in the bale, they piss on you. And, and you mean that the Frisians, other cows don't do that? Oh, they do, but they don't mean to do it. The pattern of a Jersey cow urinating on him carries the same level of disgust and contempt that it was formed in. And even though it's after the place and the time, it's the pattern that's still loaded with that emotion. It still carries that emotion. And the interesting thing is later on we're in class and I use it as an example because this, this is very much part of their, their classwork. And I talked about the looking at the cows and there's a jersey. And Pete arcs up again. He says, well, they F and R. Just the word is enough to trigger what it triggers, not only an image of a jersey cow, but the disgust and the contempt he felt at the time, emotions carry that emotion, uh, that emotion in which they were formed. Patterns formed in moments of strong emotion, such as stress or anxiety, will be very difficult to change. This is an important factor if you're considering domestic violence or other forms of familiar abuse, because usually that's done in an, in an environment of high stress and it's emotionally charged, those patterns will be very difficult to change. The example I use is that one year I took a group of senior students, trained them up to crew on some big ocean yachts, and we went sailing across to Tasmania. And the first night out at sea, we're starting to rock. And of course, the boys were down below and they started to get sick. So they'd come up from down below and go to the rail and throw up. And Dougie used to come up from the cabin and he clambered over, you know what a yacht that has a huge big winch and lots of ropes and Dougie, instead of going around it, clambered over it. And I was worried he was going to trip and fall overboard. So I said, hey Dougie, next time you come up, go around the winch, don't climb over it. And he agreed, that made a lot of sense. You know, he clambered over those ropes another six or eight times each time he come up to throw up over the rail because the pattern of that process was like a script and he acted it out even though he knew intellectually it didn't make any sense and I had told him, you trip on the ropes and fall overboard, it's game over, we won't find you at night at sea. Even in spite of that knowledge, he acted out the same script. And exactly the same thing happens when you've got child abuse or domestic violence. They are acting a script. And no amount of intellectual discussion and intellectual assent will change that. Patterns can prompt behaviour that bypasses rational thinking. I'll give you an example. A few years ago in Adelaide, there was a bureaucratic reshuffle and one guy finished up on a horizontal promotion or a horizontal shift 
to another role altogether. I don't think it was promotion, but the job was administering cemeteries in the city. And he found that there were thousands of graves in these cemeteries of stillborn and children that had died in infancy. And there was no record of them. It was just a, a forgotten chapter in the life of the cemetery. And he set about to try and establish the names of the babies and where they're buried, to bring some closure to parents that are still grieving all these decades later. Fortunately, he was able to interview one of the old grave diggers, and the interview is fascinating because the grave digger went into detail of what happened. He said the van would put up, pull up and these little boxes were in there and we would bring our wheelbarrows up and put the boxes in, the, in there and it was just like wheeling our grandchildren. There's a pattern. These aren't just dead bodies. There's a pattern of grandchildren. Look what plays out. Then he said, we took them to this big circle. It wasn't just a regular grave. We made a circle. And we put sand in the bottom so that the kids could play. And we put all the little boxes with the heads together so that each little child, each little child would know that they're not on their own. And you know what? He said, and we never, ever filled in the grave without having somebody to officiate. Now, isn't that remarkable? At a rational level, they're not little children that are going to play in a wheelbarrow with sand or with each other. So what doesn't this guy get about dead bodies? That's not the point. Patterns are able to give us a view of what's happening. In this case, it's part of their work. And it sets them up to complete a, a routine so that a remarkable series of actions happened over and over again. As I say, patterns can prompt behaviour that is not rational. It bypasses rational thinking and can still set up a course of action that is entirely consistent with a pattern, not bodies, but grandchildren. Patterns can set us up to believe something that isn't true, and I guess that's similar to the grave diggers. But this is a little bit unique in that we're carrying what is true and what we think is true. Years ago in the 80s, with a mate of mine, we built an ultralight aeroplane powered by a little change oil motor that screamed its head off just behind your head. A dicey little thing to fly. But anyway, I must have put it on an online CV that I built a Hovey Wingding. I'm not sure why. Showing off, probably. Anyway, I get a phone call from a fellow, Peter McDougall. He's a retired airline pilot. And he's going to buy a Hovey Wingding. And he must have Googled it and my CV comes up and I've made one. So he phones me up. He says, I understand you built a Hovey Wingding. I'm about to buy one. I said, yeah, buy it and hang it in your shed, but don't fly it. You'll kill yourself. Anyway, we got talking and he was wondering what else I did with aeroplanes. Well, I didn't do much else after that. I was more involved in my study at the time in Human Givens. I was talking a bit about it. And I talked a bit about pattern matching because it underpins pretty much all the thinking. And after a while he said, well, that is amazing. That solves a question I've had in my mind for years because I remember being in a kid in primary school, elementary school, and the inspector came in and he had a huge collage and it had everything on it. It had kids playing by the beach and swings and slides 
and it had sailboats and caravans and sports cars and motorbikes and scooters. It was just a collage of incredible detail, a bit like a Where's Wally thing. And he said, the inspector told us all to look at this picture very closely. So he said, we all looked at this picture. Then the inspector rolled it all up. And he said, now, I want you to write down where the aeroplane was. Top right corner, top left, bottom left, whatever. And he said, everyone in the class wrote down where the aeroplane was, including Peter McDougall, because he's always been interested in aeroplanes. He knew exactly what aeroplane it was and where it was. Then the inspector unrolled the collage again, and there's no aeroplane. And Peter McDougall said, I thought it was some sort of a magic trick because I know where the aeroplane was and I know what sort of aeroplane and it's not there at all. What happened to it? Well, with understanding pattern matching, it just tells us that we can believe something that isn't true. There wasn't ever an aeroplane there. But when the inspector said, where was the aeroplane? Here comes a pattern of an aeroplane and all you need to do is put it somewhere on the paper and... It's all set, but it isn't true. Patterns can be created in adult years and they can become life-changing. Some of you may remember the movie Shine, David Helfcott, brilliant pianist. Well, his wife, in later years, she wrote an autobiography and she recounts this. David came in, they bought a property in uh, northern New South Wales, and David come in one morning, he's got his hands in his overalls, and he says to Gillian, his wife, who are these men out here? And Gillian said, oh, they're the builders, they're building my new pottery. She's a, a potter. And he's standing there, and he says, who owns this place? And Gillian said, we do, we've owned it for nearly five years. And he's completely perplexed. He doesn't have an own, a pattern for ownership. A concert pianist touring the world in hotels and apartments and there's always somebody that looks after the place and it's not him and he doesn't own anything. He didn't have a pattern for ownership. And Gillian realised that and understood how we will process this information. So she got a big sheet of butcher's paper and some texture pens and drew a picture of a big grand piano and then David playing it and music notes rising up off the piano and then people lining up, stick figures and all with a dollar sign above their head. And this, people, this piece of drawing just emerges and David is just engrossed and he keeps playing and the people keep lining up and the dollars keep building up. And she said, we take all those dollars and put them in this brick building over here. And you keep playing, the people keep coming and the money builds up and it goes over there and he's looking at it. And she said, and then we took all the money out of this building and we gave it to the people who used to own this place. They've got the money and we've got the house and the property and David's standing there and he's amazed he said well in that case I better go and have a look at it and he was gone for three quarters of an hour he now has a pattern for ownership and he's seeing the property in a sense for the first time through the eyes of owner but hey here's the clincher Gillian records in her book from that time on he made the bed and he did the vacuuming. There you go, girls. Butcher's paper and texture pens, you're in. Now, what if approximations are used instead of accurate patterns to make sense of things? It's a good question. Especially given the subtleties of social interaction and the demands of relationships. Most of the people I saw in my practice were using a limited array of patterns and many people were helped enormously by adding to their repertoire of patterns. By being able to draw on an expanded array of sense-making patterns, their perceptions became closer 
to a shared model of reality. Social interaction became more fulfilling and relationships more rewarding. They were able to make sense of these things in a more accurate, fulfilling way. Now, not all people were helped. There are some people who seem unable to accept that reality is what each of us build using our experiences, our learning and our sense-making process. Some people regard reality as an absolute, a franchise they seem to have exclusive rights to. It's a view that allows them to dismiss others' views as, as not worth considering. They hold their point of view with such a tenacity, it's not unlike a primitive survival response. Their sense of life, identity and future seems to be threatened if they contemplate a revision to their thinking. It's little wonder their social interaction is mostly characterised by superficial, short-term, one-sided encounters and their relationships limited to those able or resigned to tolerate their inflexibility. While we would not tolerate approximations in the supermarket, we need to be open to the possibility that the sense-making process may not be serving our best interest and need to be prepared to ask that crucial question, is this how it really is or just the way I think it is?